Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today we're going to be discussing Glaucon's arguments from Book 2 of Plato's Republic. Now, one minor thing to note before we get into that uh, is the shift in the conversation that occurs between Books 1 and Book 2. Uh, this is the reason that a lot of scholars believe that Book 1 of the Republic was written separately, and the rest of it was written later and appended on as a continuation of the discussion. Uh, this is largely because uh, when Thrasymachus... Uh, the Sophist leaves at the, the end of Book One of the Republic. Uh, it is treated as an ending in aporia, as a kind of shrug of uncertainty, uh, where no one will exactly uh, come to any conclusions about the nature of justice. This is very similar to the the ending of the rest of the earlier, um, at least supposedly earlier, uh, Socratic style dialogues of Plato which would uh, make arguments for and against uh, different versions of, uh, or different definitions of a concept, but end in uh, what's called aporia, or a kind of uncertainty, uh, without coming to any definite conclusions. But then the rest of the Republic, starting with book two, is about coming to definitive conclusions about the nature of justice. Uh, this is more akin to Plato's middle dialogues, uh, which were the sort of constructive phase where Plato was constructing doctrines, where we find the, the doctrine of the forms, a lot of his ethical theories and such. Um, and I discussed more of this in the introductory video on the Republic, so if you want to see a little bit more of this in detail, uh, look to there. Uh, but I did want to sort of put a flag on this so we're aware of the sort of change that is happening uh, in the text of the Republic at this point. Uh, but after the departure of Thrasymachus, Another dialogue partner, Glaucon, who is the brother of Plato, uh, picks up the conversation with Socrates. Um, because Socrates gave a good answer to Thrasymachus's charges that injustice was superior to justice, Glaucon brings up that he may not have done a good enough job of doing so. And Glaucon here brings up that he is being sort of a, uh, what we would call a devil's advocate. Uh, he claims that he agrees with Socrates that justice is a good and a noble thing. However, he wants to make sure that we can provide solid arguments for doing so. Now, um, throughout the text, we can question whether uh, Glaucon is uh, is being disingenuous about this and actually does uh, favor injustice in some circumstances, but we'll set that aside for now and look more to it later in the text. For now, I want to focus specifically on uh, the nature of the dispute between Glaucon and Socrates. Both of them agree that justice is a good thing, uh, unlike Thrasymachus. However, they disagree about what kind of good justice is. So they begin this section of the text by, by making a threefold division uh, between di three different kinds of good things. Uh, the first that they bring up uh, are things such as joy harmless pleasures that have uh, that have no results beyond the joy of having them, to quote uh, Glaucon in the description. Uh, these are what we call intrinsic goods. goods, goods which are good for their own sake and only for their own sake. We would contrast these uh, with extrinsic goods, goods which are good for the sake of something else, Right, of the, for the sake of gaining something else, but not good in themselves. Uh, the examples of this he gives are things like physical training, medical treatment when sick, medicine itself, and other ways of making money. Uh, and he calls these onerous, but beneficial to us. And we wouldn't choose them for their own sakes, but for the sakes of the rewards and other things that come from them. Money is the prototypical example of an extrinsic good. It's not good for its own sake. Right? No one wants money to have it, uh, despite uh, what certain cartoons about, uh, about Scrooge McDuck might tell us. Right? No one wants money purely to have it. They only want money because of what it can give us. Right? Money represents the ability to acquire things, which is itself the thing we want to acquire. Right? So these are extrinsic goods, goods for which are for the sake of something else. Then the third division is the highest and noblest kind of good, according to both Socrates and Glaucon, which is, the, which is that category of goods which are both intrinsically and extrinsically good. Uh, they are something which is worth pursuing for their own sake, 
but also that the kind of thing that will give you something else if you have it. Uh, his examples here are knowledge, seeing, and being healthy. Right? So we have knowledge, right? We know things. It is good to know things in and of itself. We want to know purely for the sake of knowing, but at the same time, we might also seek knowledge because it allows us to do things. Knowledge is power, as, uh, as we might say. The same goes for the experience of the senses. We want to experience things on their own, right, for no other reason than to experience them. But also seeing in the other senses allow us to navigate the world. They allow us to acquire knowledge, right? They allow for the, uh, the perception of pleasure, right? All of these are good things that we, we pursue by way of the senses. The same goes for health, right? It's good to be healthy, but also being healthy allows us to do other things as well. So we have goods which are both intrinsic and extrinsic. The two disagree about which of these categories justice falls into. Socrates wants to claim that justice falls into the highest and noblest category of goods. He claims that justice is both intrinsically good and extrinsically good. It is good to have, and it is good because of the results that come from justice, and in particular, a reputation for justice. Glaucon, however, is going to argue that justice is only extrinsically good. Right? That justice is one of these onerous types of goods that we would not pursue if we could get the good things that come from it without actually having to, to go through the work of having the thing. Right? So uh, medical treatment when sick uh, or physical exercise are very good examples of purely extrinsic goods. If you could be healthy without taking the bitter medicine, of course you would want to do it, right? If you could be physically fit without exercising, you would want to be physically fit without having to exercise. Now, there's a small caveat here, and this is often an objection I'll get, is that maybe you enjoy exercising. Exercise is a form of entertainment. But even in that case, exercise is still extrinsically good because it's for the sake of entertainment, enjoyment, joy, happiness, right? Something beyond simply itself, and also physical fitness. So how do we decide whether justice, or any good in particular, is merely extrinsically good, or if it is also intrinsically good? And we can look to sense perception, for example. Would we want to get all of the things from sense perception, but not have the actual uh, input of the senses? In other words, if we were able to navigate the world and experience pleasure and, uh, and all of these things without actually uh, experiencing the world directly, um, say maybe through some kind of... Uh, some kind of direct information implant into our brain or something something outlandish and science fiction-y like that, right? If we were capable of navigating the world just as well if we as if we had all the five of our senses, but we were blind or deaf or we had anosmia, we couldn't smell, right? Something like this. Would that be just as good? And I think it's apparent that it would not be. It would not be just as good uh, to be able to navigate the world, but not be able to see it. We want sense inputs in this case, purely for their own sake, not just because of what it can get us. And so we have to figure out if justice is this sort of thing. Would we want to be just if we could get all of the things that came along with justice, all of the good things that come along with justice, mostly the reputation for justice and what comes with that, uh, which is what they more or less focus on. If we could do all of that, if we could get all of the things that we would be getting from justice without actually having to be just, would we want to? Socrates argues that we still ought to pursue justice, even if we could gain all of its benefits without being just. Glaucon says, of course not. Justice is something difficult. It is something that we would not like to do unless we have to. 
And so this is where um, Glaubkin brings up uh, something like um, what comes to be known later on in the sort of philosophical tradition as something like a social contract theory uh, of the origin of justice. Right. Um, he says, we can see most clearly that those who practice justice do it unwillingly because they lack the power to do injustice. If in our thoughts we grant to a just and an unjust person the freedom to do whatever they like, we can then follow both of them and see where their desires would lead. He points out that we have uh, a desire, an innate desire, to do injustice. It's a good thing to gain from other people without having to benefit them. But we also want to avoid injustice being done to us. It is a terrible thing to have injustice done to us. And so he says we make uh, covenants and agreements with people and form a society and form laws and such, such that we agree not to do injustice to other people in exchange for them not doing injustice to us, or at least in exchange for protection from the injustice of others. Because having injustice done to oneself is such a terrible thing that it isn't worth it um, to be able to do injustice if other people can do the same to me. Right. <clears throat> and so what this more or less turns into is a kind of uh, social contract, right? where we give up the ability uh, to do injustice to others in exchange for others giving up that same ability to do injustice to us. Interestingly, there are some who would, who would choose the opposite of this. And it's not only, uh, as Glaucon indicates, people who think they can get away with it. Because Glaucon does certainly think that if people could get away with doing injustice, but not having injustice done to them, they would do so. I think we can point to some examples, um, even in our contemporary world, uh, of people and circumstances in which people would choose to be able to commit injustice, even if it means others have the opportunity and the means to commit injustice against them. And I'm, of course, talking about politics, especially electoral politics. Most of modern electoral politics boils down to this. It is the ability to uh, exercise power over others and to force others to conform to one's own will, even at the risk of others then using those selfsame powers to enforce their will and commit injustices upon you. All depending on, you know, winning or losing an election, all depending on who is in control of the levers of power, etc. And so, um, I think Glaucon's uh, account here of, uh, of a sort of social contract, of this becoming the sort of basis and formation of society, uh, is only the case in, in a limited sense, if it ever occurred historically, which it likely did not. Um, even in theory, though, this is only the case in a very limited sense in that um, we would only make this choice, right? This would only be the obvious choice if we really do think that it is an even trade or a better trade. And in a lot of cases, as I indicated, I think that uh, a lot of people will make the opposite choice, that people are willing to allow other people to do injustice to them under certain circumstances if only they are allowed to do injustice to others under other circumstances. And a lot of people find this to be an even or beneficial trade. But I digress. This is really a side point. Uh, this isn't really something that Glaucon or Socrates consider. They find this uh, this trade uh, to be a good one, such that Glaucon thinks that justice, in other words, refraining from doing injustice to others if they refrain from doing injustice to you, is a kind of middle ground between what we want, which is to do injustice without it having been done to us, and what we want least, that is, not being able to commit injustice on others, but having others doing injustice to us. So, he constructs a few thought experiments. Right? One, being, um, one being the, uh, the Ring of Gyges, uh, which is a, uh, a fable that he tells to kind of uh, illuminate the, um, the only extrinsic goodness of, in, of uh, justice. And then further, uh, the, uh, what becomes known as the test case, 
which is his hardest and strongest argument, or I should say str hardest to refute, it, strongest argument, uh, against the intrinsic goodness of justice, that Socrates, quite frankly, spends the rest of the Republic trying to refute, uh, both directly and indirectly. So we'll begin uh, with the story of the Ring of Gyges. Uh, so it tells the story of, uh, of uh, a man, uh, the ancestor of a man named Gyges of Lydia, uh, who was a shepherd in the in the yeah, province of Lydia who finds uh, a magical ring. Right? He finds this magical golden ring, uh, and he finds eventually that this ring allows him the ability to become invisible. Uh, and so the mechanics of it, if this matters, is he wears the ring, say something like this, uh, or this better example, something like this, right? and when he turns the setting inwards, like so, he becomes invisible, or maybe it would be better to say imperceptible, um, because he's not purely talking about visual perception, um, because in the stories it doesn't seem like people notice him disappearing, it's just that he passes beneath notice. So um, the, uh, the, magic, the magic ring, the one ring from Tolkien, is perhaps not the best mechanical uh, description of the Ring of Gyges. Uh, it's perhaps something more like um, the uh, the, uh, the the psychic effects in Doctor Who, for example, where uh, where the wearer of some uh, of some object becomes imperceptible, becomes beneath notice. Um, something like that uh, is more what we should be thinking of here, right? It's where somebody can't be noticed, rather than someone becoming in invisible to sight. Yeah, because that's noticeable. It's just that when the wearer of the ring turns the setting inwards, they're no longer being noticed. And they can get away with whatever they choose to. Yeah. And he says the, um, the, the wearer of this ring arranges for himself to be made one of the emissaries to the king. Uh, and to quote, um, when he arrived at the king's court, he seduced the king's wife, attacked the king with her help, killed him, and took over the kingdom. Pretty short order, um, a uh, pretty direct way of uh, of achieving power using this incredible power that one already has. So Glaucon asks, well, fine, what if there were two such rings? One was given to an unjust man and one was given to a just man. Would they act differently given the ability to, uh, to avoid any consequences of their unjust behavior? And Glaucon argues that no, of course, they would act exactly the same. And if the just person, just, uh, which he's uh, he's uh, a bit skeptical about calling this person just, if someone did not act in this way, if someone acted justly and unselfishly, if entirely freed from consequences, he says that, um, that we would, uh, that some, that such a person would, who would not touch another person's property, etc., would be thought wretched and stupid by everyone aware of the situation. Though, of course, they'd praise him in public, deceiving each other for fear of suffering injustice. So his point here is that anyone would do injustice if they were capable of getting away with it. And anyone who wouldn't, we would think, rather than praising them in our heart of hearts, we might praise them among other people to maintain our own reputation for justice. But we would probably think that they were a bit naive, a bit foolish, right? That they should be doing more with this incredible power that they have. So this, he thinks, is again uh, a solid argument for the intrinsic difficulty rather than goodness of justice. That justice is only good because it gives us a certain reputation and it allows us to avoid having injustice done to us and it allows us to navigate society well in a certain way, right? Uh, in a civilized manner. Injustice, he says, uh, is what we would really like to do, but its consequences are so dire uh, that we avoid it, that we choose justice for the sake of avoiding the consequences of injustice. So this is case one. This is the Ring of Gyges. The other example he gives is what's called the test case. 
uh, or what has been called uh, by later scholars, I should say, the test case. Um, and this, in this thought experiment, he sets up two lives. Uh, so he asks us to consider which of these two lives is better, is better lived. Which should we choose to live if given the choice between the two of them? Well, one is the perfectly unjust person. The other is the perfectly just person, but to make the difference far more stark. He points out that the perfectly unjust person, so we're not confusing the benefits of justice from justice itself, right? the intrinsic from the extrinsic. He says that the perfectly unjust person should have a perfect reputation for justice and should be always capable of getting away with anything, any act of injustice that he pleases. Because, he says, what else, what is more unjust than to have an unearned reputation for justice? And I think we can agree with this, a kind of, uh, kind of, um, we think of the worst villains uh, as those who are thought to be just by many of their followers, or even the heroes who are tricked into thinking that they are good people, right? This is why betrayal stories are so impactful. Uh, it's not just because of the shocking turn. It's because it makes the nefarious villain having uh, that they were so bad all along that they were capable of, of portraying themselves as just. That's how unjust they were. On the flip side of this, he insists that the perfectly just person should not have any reputation for justice. Uh, because he says it should be a matter of wanting to be just rather than wanting to have a reputation for justice. So in order to separate out the intrinsic from the extrinsic good of justice, we have to take away the extrinsic good and keep only what is intrinsically good. And so he says that the, uh, the perfectly just life, the, the life of the perfectly just person could well be destitute, and have a complete reputation for injustice. Everyone in society could think that the perfectly just person is absolutely, utterly unjust. Socrates here would then have to prove that despite this, it would be better to live as a just person with none of the good consequences of justice than to live as the perfectly unjust person with all of the good consequences that ordinarily come with justice. And Socrates, of course, takes up this challenge. Uh, and he takes up this challenge in a few unique ways. Uh, it's also important to notice, uh, to, uh, to note that uh, Adamantus, another dialogue partner who, uh, who also had some um, introductory lines in the first book, um, brings up the issue of, uh, of religion, the gods, and the afterlife. Uh, and mostly in his discussion with Socrates, this serves to set these aside as concerns, uh, because, of course, Socrates would know, or Plato, I suppose, would know, that an audience would object uh, to this sort of test case by saying, well, fine, perhaps it would be better uh, in this life, if this life is all that, all that there is, to be perfectly unjust if you can get away with it. But perhaps there is eternal or at least long-lasting, reward and punishment in the afterlife. And so that our good deeds will be rewarded and our bad deeds will be punished. And so they get into a uh, religious discussion to how uh, we can sort of get around this. Because we want to say that justice has, uh, that we're separating apart justice from any of its rewards and any of its consequences, be they temporal or eternal. And we want to say that the unjust person has everything that would be gained by the just person, gained by justice ordinarily. The unjust person should gain all of the rewards ordinarily attributable to justice, whether those are temporal or eternal. And the perfectly just person should gain none of the rewards ordinarily attributed to justice in order to separate out the intrinsic from the extrinsic good of justice. This is a very difficult choice. We might think something like uh, we, we, 
that our conscience might bother us as an unjust person. And perhaps, but we also have to ask whether that is something extrinsic or intrinsic. Is our conscience, is, is the, are the good feelings that come from doing the right thing, are those something that is fundamentally a part of justice? Or are those a consequence from it? And I think, it seems to me at least, uh, that this even would be a consequence from justice. And so it should be stripped away from the perfectly just person. And we see this because uh, we point out that the unjust person would be able to do anything that he pleases in society. And that includes helping himself, helping his friends, harming his enemies, uh, helping his family, having a long-lasting reputation for justice, having everyone think that he is perfectly just, including his family, including his friends, including his descendants, and including his society. Whereas the perfectly just person, if we were to take away all of the consequences of justice, all of the good consequences, the perfectly just person would fail at all of the good he tries to do. Not only uh, is he unable to achieve good things for himself, but he's unable to achieve good things for others, even through his just actions. And so even in trying to help others, he fails. And so this is part of how he gains his perfect reputation for injustice, despite being perfectly just. And Socrates is still going to maintain, after all of this, and of course after a good bit of extra argument, that it is better to live the just life, even if that is all one has, than to live the unjust life, even if it gains one everything. This is the point he makes that justice, and virtue in general, is sufficient for happiness and for flourishing, in a word for eudaimonia, uh, to use a word more often associated with Aristotle. And of course, speaking of Aristotle, Aristotle disagreed with his teacher Plato on this very, very strongly. Uh, Aristotle held that justice, virtue in general, was not enough to live a flourishing, happy life. Aristotle held that one had to be in the right circumstances, with the right upbringing, in the right kind of city, with the right kind of wealth, even, in order to live a happy and flourishing life. Virtue was a necessary but insufficient condition for happiness. Whereas Socrates' argument throughout the Republic is that even with nothing else, even if everything else is going horribly and there is no reward, whether temporal nor eternal, for one's good behavior, so to speak, that justice is sufficient, not only necessary, but sufficient for living a happy, flourishing, and fulfilled life. Now, I'm sure you want to know what his uh, arguments are, uh, but I am, of course, going to leave us there. Because from here, uh, they go on what seems like a tangent to describe the perfectly just city rather than the perfectly just person. Uh, and that is no accident. The, uh, the intention going forward through this is, uh, as I, again, I've mentioned in other lectures, the intention of this is to look at the macro level of justice, justice in the city, to try and gain insights into the micro level, which is much harder to observe. And so we can discover what the just person is by looking at what the just city is. And so that is what they continue to do uh, throughout the middle books of the Republic, the rest of book two, moving forward through the next few. Um, and so the next uh, few lectures in this series will be looking at justice on this sort of macro uh, political level, rather than justice of the individual, although we, would, we will need to keep in mind that this is all for the sake of allegory. All of this, the entire rest of the Republic, is intended to figure out what justice is in the individual person, in the individual soul, and then to figure out if that is intrinsically a good thing. And if you want to know his real answer, skip ahead to book nine. Uh, there already is a lecture recorded for that. Link below. It's also near the end of this, uh, near the end of the series. So go ahead and take a look if you really have to. But I do highly recommend reading through gradually because it does take a lot of philosophical work to justify such an incredibly bold claim. 
So with that, uh, I do hope you follow along uh, with the rest of the Republic uh, and or that you read it on your own as well, uh, and that we it will eventually get there to an answer to this very, very difficult question. But until then, I will see you next time.